right, brother. Let's go to John chapter 12. And if you want to just mark this chapter, because this is where our second message will be this morning as well. John 12. Let's read verse 12 down through verse 19. It says, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, till when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of his grave, and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. The whole, the world, is gone after him. This was the week of the Passover feast. And during the week of the Passover feast, all the males were required to come to Jerusalem. And they usually brought their family with them. And so the population in Jerusalem was far, far more than what it normally would be. This, this place was just packed full of people, thousands upon thousands of people. And the uh, Lord had raised Lazarus from the grave near Bethany. He had done this on purpose. He raised him from the grave near Bethany. And they had gone and they had declared this. They had spread word that he had raised a man from the grave. And, and all the people at the feast were saying, whispering to one another, do you think he'll come to the feast? Do you think he'll come up? And then they began to spread word and said, he's coming. He's coming to the feast. And so this great host of people went out with palm branches in their hands, laying these palm branches down before him and crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, deliver us. Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now what do we see here? I'm going to look at the work of God, and then we'll see an example of grace, and then we'll hear a personal word to each of us. First of all, this was the work of God. Everything that took place here is God the Father and the Son of God, Christ Jesus, bringing this all to pass, every bit of it. Down in verse 23, here's what was happening. The Lord answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. That's why this was happening. God had purposed this hour. It was the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. Verse 28, he said, Father, glorify thy name. And then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. This was God glorifying his Son. This was the Son fulfilling all the scriptures, all the law and the prophets. He was working this. I try to show you Thursday night that when Mary came and broke open that box of ointment and anointed the feet of the Lord, there's no good works that are done in this world except what were ordained from the foundation of the world. And they're brought to pass by the Lord working in the heart of his people. And that's a good evidence of it right there when Mary broke that box of ointment open on his feet because Song of Solomon says, the scripture said, while the king is seated at his table, my spikenard sends forth the perfume thereof. That scripture had to be fulfilled. It had to be fulfilled. And Christ worked that in Mary's heart and, and she came and broke open that box of ointment on him and the ointment, the fragrance filled the house. Well, the same way, these are scriptures that had to be fulfilled. And the Lord is working everything to bring these people there to praise him and call upon him. He worked this to glorify the Son of Man, to glorify God's name in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord never lifted up his voice in the streets. He wasn't trying to get a following. He was, he was unlike preachers and churches in our day. He wasn't trying to just gather crowds. That wasn't what he was about. 
And a lot of times he would work a miracle and he would tell them, don't go tell people. Go home and tell them what great things the Lord's done for you, but don't go broadcasting. He didn't want them following him because of, of simply because their bellies were full and, their, and they were looking for prosperity and things like that. He told us, don't do your alms before men. Uh, don't advertise your ministries that you're working to try to attract people by that. You know, don't advertise all the different, all the different uh, programs you have to try to just attract people by that. He never attracted people with things like that, never at all. But this is his hour. This is his hour. This is the hour that he's going to be glorified and the whole world's going to see what he's going to do for his people on the cross. And so he went to Bethany. Whenever he heard Lazarus was sick, he waited four days till Lazarus died. And there was a lot of Jews that got gathered up there. And he did that on purpose because that's close to Jerusalem and he raised Lazarus from the grave. That was a public miracle like like hardly any, anything else he had done. He hadn't done anything that publicly and that amazing. And he did it so that they would go and spread word and right here at the time of this Passover was coming up so that this would take place, so that this would take place. This cause, for this cause, it said, many, had, many bore record that Lazarus was raised, that he had raised him. And it says, verse 18, for this cause, the people also met him, for they had heard that he had done this miracle. That's why they went. They'd already wanted to take him and make him a king. Now listen to this carefully. There were probably some people in this crowd that he was working grace in their heart, and they were they heard he worked that miracle, and they saw grace in it. They saw Christ and being the salvation of his people, and they came there with a true heart. But the majority of these people, the majority of these people laying these palm branches down and crying out, Hosanna, they had already, prior to this, wanted to take him and make him a king, and our Lord prevented it. But here, he just took his hand off of them, and here they come. They've heard he's raised Lazarus, and they come, and they start calling him king, and they want him to be the king. But all he had to do was take his restraining hand off of them. But he's working this. Listen to Proverbs 19, 21. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. They're doing what he determined before to be done. The preparations of the heart in, uh, the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. He put this in their heart to do this. Now, this is the Lord fulfilling the law and the prophets. That's why we say the Lord is working this, because he's the only one that fulfills the law and the prophets. And this is him fulfilling the law and the prophets. Let me show you that. Go with me to Genesis 49. Genesis chapter 49. And verse 10, by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God moved Jacob to prophesy of this right here. He's speaking of Judah, his son, but he's speaking of Christ Jesus, the Lord, to come. Now listen to this. It's Genesis 49, 10. The scepter, that is the rule, the dominion, the king, the throne, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Shallow means him to whom the throne and the glory belongs. That's who Christ is. He's shallow. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's coat unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. That's who we see in our text. We see Shiloh. Here's the king. They come out crying, he's the king, and he is. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the king to whom the kingdom belongs. And here he comes now, and the people are gathered to him. They're coming to him. And he shed his own precious blood for his people. He washed his garments in his own blood, washing his people in his own blood. That's what he came for. This was the fulfillment of scripture. Daniel, go with me to Zechariah 9. Daniel, right before the New Testament, Zechariah 9. Daniel, 
go back, Malachi, then Zechariah. Daniel had prophesied of this. He said 70 weeks are determined, and he said in the 69th week, he said the Lord is going to be cut off, but not for himself. That's what was taking place here. That's why he came to Jerusalem, to be cut off as a substitute of his people. But right here in Zechariah 9, this is 500 years, over 500 years before Christ came, and Zechariah foretold this. Speaking by the Spirit of God, Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He's just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a, a colt, the foal of an ass. You know, the Lord Jesus, before this in one of the other gospels, he sent his apostles to get this donkey and, and her foal. He, said, he told him right where they'd be. And they went, and it, they belonged to another man. And they went, and the man said, why are you taking this ass and her colt? And he, they said, the Lord has need of him. And the man didn't put up any opposition. <laughs> he just let them have it, have them. How do you think that happened? The Lord did it. He, and the Lord knows where his people are. He sends his gospel right to his people, right to his people. And he calls us to himself, and he calls us in Scripture a wild ass's colt. This colt to this donkey had never been ridden, and Christ just got on him and rode him. And he tames his people, and just like he guided this ass's colt right into Jerusalem, he's guiding his people right into heavenly Jerusalem. That's what our Lord is doing. When you read this book, you see all these Scriptures fulfilled by Christ. When you read this book, Read this book looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who the book's about. He is the fulfillment of the law. The first five books of the Bible is the law. He's the fulfillment of the law. He's the fulfillment of all the prophets, and they all wrote of him. He said that plainly. They all spoke of me. Come to him looking for him. When you read a passage of Scripture, and you see a sinner in that passage of Scripture, and you see somebody faithful in that passage of Scripture, in the sinner... See yourself. And the faithful one in the passage, see a picture of Christ. See a picture of Christ. When you read the scripture and you see a sinner, who are you in that passage? The apostles, when they read a scripture, or, or were the apostles, when the Lord said, one of you is going to betray me. One by one, they went around the table saying, Lord, is it I? They knew what they were capable of. They saw themselves as sinners. If you want to get the value of this book, read this book seeing yourself, your own self, as the sinner in whatever passage you'll read. And see, if it's a man that's faithful, look for how that pictures Christ, because I guarantee you it pictures Christ. And look for him in his scriptures, and you'll get the most out of it. It's all about him and the works he does. It's all about him. Now, secondly, let's see an example of grace. Now, this great host, they cried out, Hosanna. Hosanna. That means save us now. Deliver us now. That's what it means. That's what it means. They said, Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now, Psalm 118. Why don't you go there and look. Psalm 118. This is where they're quoting from. And here, I want you to read it because I want you to see this one phrase here. And we'll understand something about what they intended and what they meant. Psalm 118, verse 25. Here's where, they, here's where they, they got that from. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. That's what Hosanna means, save now. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Now, without a new heart and without spiritual understanding, that's the majority of these people that came there laying these palms down. Without a new heart, without spiritual understanding, the majority only wanted temporal prosperity. That's all they wanted. That's all they want. They're under Roman rule right now. It, it would be like, it'd be like the folks in Ukraine right now. They want to be delivered from, from Russia. Well, that's what the Jews want. They wanted to be delivered from Rome. 
from Romans rule. That's what they want. And they wanted just a political deliverance. And they had, they had heard he raised Lazarus from the grave. Imagine if you thought you could have a king that could deliver you from political, from a political uh, bondage and also could give you good health and keep you from dying. But they wanted it right then. They wanted it now. They wanted prosperity in this life. So they wanted to take him and make him an earthly king. Make him their king. And all he had to do was take his restraining hand off of them. And by leaving his restraining hand off of him, our Lord, when he went and he permitted himself to be arrested, and he permitted himself to be brought before that, that, that kangaroo court that he stood before, and they're charging him, these same folks, just a little while later, within the same week, are crying out this. In John 19, 15, they said, Away with him. Away with him, crucify him. Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? You were just calling him your king? They said, we have no king but Caesar. Why? Because he didn't give them the prosperity. He, they, they didn't see, they, they saw we're not going to get what we want in this life. Our Lord said, my kingdom's not of this world. My kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom's not from hence. The, the salvation our Lord came to work out for his people, he provides temporal things in this life for his people. We don't have anything but what we receive from the Lord. He provides, and he knows you have need of these things, and he shall provide carnal, temporal things for his people. And he's appointed that the exact hour that you're going to die. He knows the time, the place, the means, everything about it. And you're not going to go, that's one appointment you're going to keep. You're going to keep every appointment that he said. And here's the thing about it. But that's not salvation. Him providing these things in his life is not our salvation. His people suffer a lot of things in this world. He said he would bring his people through the fire. He's going to refine his people, bringing you through the fire. You're going to suffer in this world a lot if you're a child of God. The psalmist looked at men who were prospering and said, Lord, your people aren't like these people. They have no bands in their death. They live rich and prosperous, and then they die the same way, and here we are suffering. Why does he do this? To keep his people knowing salvation's not in this world. Salvation's, his kingdom's not of this world. Salvation's not in health and wealth and prosperity in this life. Christ is salvation. And the salvation he worked out is to put away the sin of his people forever and make his people righteous. And when he gives you a new heart, he makes you behold him who is eternal life. And the promise he's promised his people is a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness which is all his creation all made by him so that the things in this life if, if you just decide you don't want him to be the king when things go south for you in this life then you prove you never was his because his people are going to suffer and they, they're going to be things that these, as soon as they saw that things weren't they weren't getting what they wanted that was it. And this world is wanting, they want, they want deliverance now. Deliver me now, right now, whatever it is. That's not how Christ works. That's not how he works. He'll leave you in the fire a long time, if, however long it takes to make you know he is the only one that will deliver. He's the only one. But here's where we see the grace of God in this. John confesses that he and the other disciples, even the apostles, did not know what these things meant either. <laughs> I get that. They didn't know either. They thought, too, Christ came to establish an earthly kingdom. We get so quick to call somebody false because they don't agree with us just exactly on doctrine or whatever. Look at verse 16. These things understood not his disciples at the first. And brethren, that's so with most of the things with God's people. We don't understand at the first. 
Well, if, uh, if they just had a better teacher, they walked with Christ Jesus the Lord for three and a half years. He taught them for three and a half years over and over, my kingdom's not of this world. He told them for three and a half years, I must go to the cross. I must be rejected of the elders. I must be lifted up like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. I came to put away the sin of my people. I must be lifted up. And we're going to see a little later, they're going to argue about him not going to the cross. But don't, don't go. Don't go. How did they come to know? How did they come to understand? When did they understand? Verse 16 says, But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they the things were, which were written. Here's grace. There was no difference in them and this multitude that turned around and cried crucify him. His apostles are going to deny they know him and they're going to leave and depart from him as well. But he came to them after he arose and he opened the scriptures to them and he made them understand and he taught them. They still didn't get it. Even after he did it, they saw him raised. He sat down, he ate with them to show that he, he said, touch me. I got a real body. Touch me. He sat down and ate. And even when he told them now, he said, now go back to Jerusalem. He was going to pour out the Holy Spirit and he sent them to preach. He said, go back to Jerusalem. After he had told them again, his kingdom's not of this earth, after he's shown them again, opened the scriptures to them, they said, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom now? Slow. Slow to understand. Slow to understand, but you see the grace of God. You see the long-suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. He keeps teaching his people and teaching his people. When are we going to understand? It says, after he was glorified, they understood. In everything, that when he first comes to you, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness shines in your heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in Christ's face. He makes you see him, who he is, the son of God, what he accomplished. He put away the sin of his people. What he, where is he now? He's at God's right hand. What's he doing? He's the king of kings ruling everything. He makes you hear this miracle of grace that he's worked for his people. And when he does this, you believe him. But you don't know everything all at once. These children run around here don't know everything at once. You're teaching them little by little by little, and they're growing up. And that's his people. The wisest one in this world knows about as much as if you took a thimble and dipped it in the ocean. And he's teaching us little by little by little, being gracious to it, even when we don't believe, even when we sin, even when we act like we never even knew him. He just keeps being gracious to his people and teaching us and growing us and weaning us all along. He takes his child and he binds his fold into the choice vine. He's the choice vine. He binds us to the choice vine, inseparably united to him because he won't let us go. Why? Because he poured out his blood for a particular people, redeemed us, and he made you justified, and he's not going to let you go. He's not going to let you go. They bowed with these palm branches, crying, Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And he brings his child to bow before him in spirit and in truth, giving him all the glory for our eternal salvation. He's king of kings. He is. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. He's working everything that's coming to pass in this world right now. This man, Christ Jesus, is in glory. He's in glory, and he's working everything that comes to pass in this life. If you ever get a hold of that, or he gets a hold of you with that, that's going to that's gonna settle you and give you some comfort knowing he is working everything for the good of his people because he, he promised the Father from eternity he would. And he's going to bring us to himself. And when he gives you that new heart, after he's made you see his glory, he doesn't just show you his glory one time. He's got a lot of glory. We couldn't take it all in if he showed us his glory all at once. 
but he shows you a little glimpse of him and a little glimpse of him, and you're growing and you're learning more and more about him. And every time he shows you some of his glory, after that he showed them his glory, they remembered. How many times is that? I try to point this out, and then somebody asked me a question, and I realized that maybe I didn't make it clear. Uh, like Mary. Mary came there. We saw she poured that ointment out. And I don't know. I mean, she sat at the Lord's feet all the time. She probably did know more than the other apostles did. She, she realized he was going to be buried. But I, don't, I doubt seriously she understood the, the fullness of what she was doing when she poured that ointment out. But the, after she did it, the Lord said, she did this to anoint my body for burial. And that's just how it is. After, after you've gone through something, after you've done a good work or you've done a sinful deed or whatever it is, after you've done it, the Lord comes and teaches you and makes you know him in whatever way he's revealing himself, and you know him more fully. It's his glory. It's his light. It's him making you know him. And you, he makes you keep knowing his electing grace, his redeeming grace, his regenerating grace, his preserving grace, his resurrecting grace, his glorifying grace, so that beginning to end, we're learning this thing is really all of grace. It's all of grace. And the best way to find out it's all of grace is for him to keep you and teach you and be merciful and long-suffering to you when you don't deserve it. That's when you really know this thing's of grace. This thing is of grace. Undeserved, unmerited, free favor of God. Now here's a personal word. It says there... Verse 12, it says, When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they went forth, they went to him. They heard he was coming. Now let me ask you this. Have we heard the Lord Jesus is coming to Jerusalem? Have you heard he's coming? He, he has come. All the Old Testament saints were looking forward to him coming. And he has come. He has come. He accomplished the redemption of his people. He's come. And right now, he's coming to Jerusalem. Wherever he's assembled his people and wherever he's sending his gospel forth, he's, that's Jerusalem. That's his heavenly Jerusalem. That's his church, his people. There's Jerusalem in, in glory and there's, there's his people in the earth and they're all one. But wherever he is, and has established his gospel, as that gospel is going forth, he's coming to Jerusalem. He's coming forth, conquering and to conquer in the hearts of his people. In those that don't know him and in those that do. Conquering and to conquer. And he's coming again. He's coming again. When he comes back, this time he came, lowly, meek and lowly. When he comes back, He's coming like they thought he was coming the first time. They wanted him to come on a big stallion, impressive. Israel couldn't have horses. Well, horses were forbidden in Israel. There's too much pride and glory and, and strength and, and too much trust in horses for that. That's why he came on a donkey. You wouldn't picture your king come riding into town on a donkey, would you? He don't do things the way we would do things. The Lord came lowly, meek and lowly, serving his people, serving the Father to save us from our sin. Not proud, not high lifted up, not some mighty general, lowly, meek and lowly. But he's the king. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. That's, that's how come he came that way. But now when he comes back the next time, he's coming in judgment. Go out to him now. Go to him now, just like they did, and bow down at his feet and, and, and give him the glory as the king of salvation now while he's coming meek and lowly. You, you can't get to Christ by trying to go up high. Or he said he forbid them in the law, if you make an altar, you can't put steps on it. I hear men talking about the steps to salvation or the steps to be born again or the steps to this or that. Our Lord said, if you put steps on that altar, 
trying to go up by steps, all you're going to do is discover your nakedness. What's that about? It means it's not of works. It means it's of him. Everything from beginning of ends to ends of him. But he comes and he reveals himself to you. And right now, while he's meek and lowly and, and willing to show himself and, be, and reveal himself in the hearts of his people, come down lowly. That's where you're going to meet Christ is down low. He won't despise the broken and contrite. He delights in the brokenhearted, the contrite-hearted. He does. He does. Let's not be like the Pharisees. Look at verse 19. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, when they saw this, they said, perceive you how you prevail nothing. They had told some among them, they said, go find him and arrest him. And listen to this, we need to kill him. And they said, see how you prevail nothing? Behold, the world has gone after him. Now let me ask you a question. Were they saying everybody in the whole world, without exception, in every generation, is going after him? That's not what they meant, was it? What do they mean? They mean a lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people went after him. As much people went after him. Our Lord Jesus Christ didn't lay down his life for everybody in this world without exception. When you read the world, that's never what it, it doesn't mean everybody without exception. There were people in hell when he died. He said, Jacob have I loved, he so have I hated. But he did lay down his life for those he chose in Christ. You know why he declares that to us? Because we are by nature proud Pharisees. And we have to be humbled in our heart to realize salvation is not in your hands. Salvation is in his hand. To give to whomsoever he will give it. He might not give it to you. He don't have to. You ever been told that by a preacher? He don't have to give you salvation. He's not obligated to save you. It's called mercy. He saves whom he will. Why? Why tell sinners? That's just going to make sinners angry. Until God reveals it in their heart. And when he reveals it in their heart, it won't make them mad. It'll make them glad. And he will. He will, he will humble you down at his feet. Those palm branches were to, that was like laying all the glory down at his feet and giving him all the praise and the honor for, for coming to save and deliver and when he's made you know him for real, you come and bow down to him and thank him for saving you in spite of you. And you realize then, if he hadn't have chosen me, I wouldn't have chosen him. If he hadn't given me a heart to know him, I'd have never knew him because I was going after the God everybody in this world's going after. And that poor little pitiful God that can't save you unless you let him. Do you want a lifeguard that can't save you unless you let him? Is that the kind of lifeguard you want? If you're drowning, do you want a lifeguard that it can't save you unless you give them permission. I want one that's going to come out there and knock me in the head if they have to and quit, make me quit flailing and get me out of there, don't you? Well, this is the Lord. He will break your bones. He will break your heart. And he never stopped breaking them. David was a believer. David sinned. And God broke his bones. He said, Lord, please heal the bones that you've broken. But he's going he's gonna to... Put us out of joint so that we can't do anything but flee to him and beg him for mercy to save us. And that's how he saves his people. See, when they said, blessed be the king, they really didn't mean he was the king of Israel. They thought they were making him the Lord of their life. No, he's the king of Israel. The king of his elect Israel, his people, Jew and Gentile. He's been king of them from eternity He's God ruling over all. He's been king of them. He was born king. The wise men came and said, where, he, where is he that's born king of the Jews? That doesn't just mean those people over there in Israel. That means his people, his elect, Jew and Gentile, true Jews, circumcised in the heart. He was the king when he came here that day. He was the king when he was hanging on that cross. He's the king right now in glory. He's really God. He's really saving his people. 
What about my free will? Your will's in bondage to your nature. Why don't a cow crawl off in the river and swim around under the river down there and, and eat other fish? Why don't he do that? That ain't his nature. And until God gives us a different nature, a new nature, a willingness to trust him and bow to him, we're proud and arrogant and we're going to condemn everybody but ourselves. He has to break our heart. Break our heart. Bow down to his feet and say, I, I don't have no business condemning anybody. Trust him. That's God. That's the, that's the king. That's the true king. That's the true king. All right, brethren, let's be dismissed. Father, thank you for this word. We pray you bless it to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for being sovereign in salvation, our sovereign king and ruler. Keep us always looking to you. Lord, we pray you would bind your fold to the choice vine today and call out one of your people and keep us inseparably united to you. Lord, we pray you bless it. Thank you, Lord, for all your mercies. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.